Tell the Lord to give you a receptive spirit to receive his word. Pray that the Lord himself will minister to you through the, from the throne of grace. He will speak to, their, to your dear heart in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we we'll pray. In Jesus' name we we'll pray. Our most high God, we bless you, we worship you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for how you have started with us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for how you spoke to us during the Sunday scripture. Father, we thank you, Lord, for how you spoke to us during the choir ministration too, that we need to always pray. Father, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, that you are about to speak to us one more time. Father, we pray that you give us a heart to receive your word in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that you take over my mouth. Father, we pray that you speak expressly from the throne of grace through me in Jesus' name. And let your name be glorified, Lord, and let your church be blessed in Jesus' name. Thank you because you know you have done it. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Today, we'll quickly be talking about where are the intercessors? Where are the intercessors? This is a question that God is asking us today, that where are the intercessors? And when God is saying where are the intercessors, it's just like God is saying where are the believers? Because there is one thing I believe. Everyone that has given their life to Christ has been called into the ministry of intercession. No exemption. It's not like there's a prayer band somewhere. So because those prayer bands are there, then you are not supposed to be interceding. Every one of us that has been that has been given our I mean that has given our life to Christ, that have repented of our sin, we have been called into the ministry of intercession. But fortunately today, believers are no more interceding. Believers are no more interceding. Today, believers are so selfish that all they do is pray about me, 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 and me. Every, look at their request. Look at their prayer point. As soon as you raise prayer point concerning somebody else, concerning the I mean sinners, concerning the church, concerning the pastors, you will see that at any prayer meeting, the voices will go down. But tell them that, oh, let your enemies die right now. Oh, let this body come down right now. You will see the energy, you will see the fervency, you will see everything that people will put into that prayer. Why? Because believers don't believe anymore in interceding on behalf of others. But the Lord is telling us today that we have been called into that ministry. And he's asking us, where are we? Where are the intercessors? Where are the intercessors? Because everyone is not hearing our cry anymore on behalf of others. All everyone is hearing is our prayer for ourselves. Our prayer for ourselves. God, that would, I mean, that thou would bless me indeed. That thou would enlarge my coast. That thou would do this for me. Oh, that thou would do all that for me. And everyone is saying, what about your sister? What about your prayer? I mean, sorry, your brother. How much prayer are you offering on, on behalf of your brother? How much prayer are you offering on behalf of your sister? We spend hours, sometimes, praying just for ourselves. 90% of the time, all we are sending to heaven is our request. Our request. Our request. We even forget about sinners that are out there. That they need to be prayed for, that the judgment of God will not come upon them. That they will come, that will, that they will come to the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But today, believers are no more doing that. And God is asking the question, where are the intercessors? I pray that the Lord will bring us back to that point in Jesus' name. That we, when we kneel on our, I mean, on our, on our knees, when we stand on our feet to pray unto God, we'll spend time to pray for others. We'll spend time to pray for the glory of God to be revealed in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's quickly open our scriptures to Ezekiel 22, verse 30. Where are the intercessors? Where are the people that God has called into the ministry of intercession? In Ezekiel 22, verse 30, the Bible says, And I sought for a man. God is looking for a man, not a group of people. And that's the mistake we make. We always believe that intercession has to do with a group of people. Oh, we have to come together. Thank God for prayer band. Thank God for I mean, prayer ministry. Thank God for uh, intercessory group. But intercession is not about a group. It's about an individual. And that's what the Bible is saying there. It says, and I sought for a man. Who is seeking for a man? Almighty God is seeking for a man. It says, I'm, for I sought for a man among them. Among who? Among believers. Among children of the Most High God. Among people that have been redeemed by his power. That should make up the hedge. And stand in the gap before me for the land. You see? And stand in the gap before me for the land. That means stand between me and those people that need prayer 
just for the I mean, for the purpose of interceding for them, that I should not destroy it. But what happened? But I found none. But I found none. That's what God is saying. I found none. I found none. I'm seeking for it every day. I'm looking for intercessors every day. I'm looking for people that will spend time and say, God, let your glory be revealed in this country. You see, what we do today is this. Believers don't pray anymore. Two things believers do. Believers gossip. When they hear problem of other people, the next thing they carry phone. I think, I think God is dealing with that sister. You know that sister? That's the way she dresses, the way she does her things. I think God... Are you called into the ministry of condemnation? No. You are called into the ministry of reconciliation as believers. You are called into the ministry of reconciliation through prayer. Instead of you going about talking and talking and talking to others, talk to God about that sister. Talk to God about that brother. Even if the person is living in sin, it is not your home business to start going all over the place talking about that person's life. All you need to do is talk to heaven. That everyone will transform that person completely. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. I say the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. What about this nation? We see what is going on in this nation. We are quick to judge. Oh, America is coming under the condemnation of God. America is coming under the judgment of God. But how much time do you spend to pray for this country? How much time do you spend to, bring, to tell God that God will do something in this country? How much time? How much time? How many days have you fasted for this country? How many days have you said, I'm waiting upon the law for a country like this? I'm waiting upon the law for those sinners there. I'm waiting upon the law for this person that has not given his or her life to Christ. That the judgment of God will not come upon that person. That that person will come to the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. How much time have you done that? You spent all the years, last year, fasting, praying for yourself. But how, many, how much time have you spent praying for others? How much time have you spent? praying for sinners. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. I say the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Today we wrestle with God over our problems until we see solutions to it. But we slumber over other people's problems. When people tell us their problem, instead of us taking it to the Lord in prayer, we just say, oh God will take care of you. We'll be praying for you. But truly we don't do it. We don't pray for them. We don't pray for them. There's nothing wrong if you have your own children. And God has blessed you with children. And you say, God, I will not let you go until you bless that sister. I will not let you go until you bless that family with children. There's nothing wrong in it. That's the ministry in which God has called us unto. That's the ministry that God has called us unto. Or you have your own job. And then oh, somebody is around you. A brother is around you. A sister is around you. It's looking, he or she is looking at me. Sorry. She or, or he is looking for a job. But all you just need to all you just do is, oh, I'll be praying for you. Which is a lie. You are not even praying for them. You don't even remember them one bit. Even if you remember, maybe you just say it in passing. God, provide job for her. If you were the one looking for that job, is that how you pray the prayer? Is that how you pray the prayer? And the problem we are having is this. We are not seeing ourselves as one body. Until we start seeing ourselves as one body, we cannot intercede the right way. Take for instance, if my finger is hurting, I know it's my finger. I know what I feel. In my body. Until you see your sister to be your finger. Until you see your sister to be your hand. Until you see your brother to be your hand. That whatever they are going through, they are not the one going, into, going through it by themselves. You are also going through that thing. If you get to that point, you'll be able to intercede properly. The Lord will take us there in Jesus' name. So the question is, how many times are we taking it upon ourselves to pray for our brothers and our sisters in problem. When I say pray, I mean real prayer with fasting for them that God will intervene in their solution, sorry, in their situation. How many times have we said, I will not let go unless you bless my sister with blessings of a job or the fruit of the womb. How many times have we spent in the presence of the Lord praying for one another, praying for the glory of God to be revealed in one another until we start becoming selfless in the school of prayer. We cannot have some of our problems solved. And that's why your problems are still lingering. Most times we, we thought it's spending more time praying for our home problem that will bring the solution. We have forgotten that the law of sowing and reaping applies in everything. That's one thing believers don't understand. It, the Bible says what? It is more blessed to give than to receive. When you sow prayer into the life of somebody, God will sow blessing into your own life too. When you sow prayer into the life of a brother, God will sow blessing into your own life too. I will show you somewhere in the scriptures. Let's open to Job 42. Verse 10. Job was a man that was going through a lot. We all, I mean, we all knew the story. Job went through a lot. He lost everything. He lost his children. But 
He tried what we have been trying as believers. He prayed, he called upon the name of the Lord until he changed his prayer. And look at the prayer he prayed in Job, what happened in Job 42 verse 10. Job 42 verse 10. The Bible says, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job. When? When he prayed for his friends. When he interceded for his friends. Until he starts interceding for his friends before his captivity turned. Those problems that you are battling with, that you are spending all your time with, change your prayer today. You will see God rolling those problems away in Jesus' name. Those problems that you are spending all your time saying, oh God, I will not let you go because of my problem. Because of my problem. Pray for others first. When you pray for others, intercede on behalf of others, you will see heaven moving on your behalf in Jesus' name. And says, when he prayed for his friend, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Twice as much as he, as he had before. You want multiplication? You want double from the Lord? Intercede on others' behalf. And the Lord will give us the grace in Jesus' name. So who is an intercessor? An intercessor is the one who takes the place of another or pleads another's, another's case before the Lord. They serve as a bridge between God and the person that needs the prayer. It might be a sinner that needs the prayer. It might be a brother that needs the prayer. It might even be a pray pastor that needs the prayer. It might be the church that needs the prayer. It might be a nation that needs the prayer. You, as an intercessor, you stand in between God and the person that needs prayer. You are like a bridge. What is the purpose of a bridge? The bridge links two places together. You are like a bridge linking the person that needs prayer unto God. You are more or, more, more or less like an attorney. If you look at it in the right sense, you are more like an attorney. What does an attorney do? Attorney plead the case of their client. Look at this high-profile case I just finished now, the case of George Zimmerman. He did not say a single word in the court, apart from what he told his I mean, attorney, or probably just a question that the judge asked him. The attorney was there to plead his case. Plead his case. That's what you are called for as an, I mean, as, as an intercessor, to plead on behalf of others, to plead on behalf of others, and the Lord will give us that grace in Jesus' name. Because of our time, we quickly go to our subheading. The first one is the command to intercessory, intercessory prayer. The second one is the challenges to inter intercessory prayer. And then the characteristics of genuine intercessor. The characteristics of genuine intercessor. The command to intercessory prayer. Let's open our Bible to 1 Timothy 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 to 4. The command to intercessory prayer. It's not an option. It's a commandment that God has given unto us. That we as believers, as soon as we give our lives to Christ, we have been given that ministry. It says, I exhort therefore, verse 1, that for all, for all supplications, prayer, intercessions, and giving unto, of, of thanks, be made for all men. I'm reading 1 Timothy 2, 1. For all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable, peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, of God our Savior. We will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So it's the commandment that God is telling us that he exhorts us that therefore that first of all, supplications, prayer, intercession, and giving unto thanks be made for all men. Be made for all men. By who? By us. By us as believers. By us as believers. So the Lord has given the commandment that we believers are expected to intercede on behalf of others, including sinners, that God's wrath will not come on the people. But God has found none of us doing that. In Isaiah 59, verse 16. Isaiah 59, verse 16. If God has not commanded it, God will not be looking for an intercessor. In Ezekiel that we read, if God has not said it, if God has not given us that job, God will not be looking for one that will stand in the gap. But because God has given the job and he sees that the job is not done, that's why God is looking for the person that will stand in the gap between him and the sinner so that the wrath of God will not come upon them. In verse 16, Isaiah 59 verse 16, and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. You see that? The Lord says so that there was no man. He's not looking for a group of men. He's looking for just one man. He's looking for just one woman that will take it upon he, he or herself and say, God, use me for your glory. Use me in the ministry of intercession. I want to bring down your glory upon this dying I mean, nation. Upon this nation that is dying in sin. That is, I mean, everything about this nation is going the other way around. But there is no man to intercede for America. 
There is no man to intercede for the sinner out there. There is no man. Why? Because believers are so much encumbered by their own problems. They are so much encumbered by their own appears that they don't even want to do it anymore. But the Lord is saying that he is commanding it. He says in verse 16, and he saw that there was no man and wondered, wondered that, that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his hand brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. In Luke 18 verse 1, the Bible made us understand that the, the, our Lord Jesus Christ he spoke a fire one to them. He says to this end, Men ought always to pray and not to faint. So believers, we are called to that ministry of prayer, but not only to pray for ourselves, but to pray for everyone. So praying always, the Bible says, praying always with all supplication, sorry, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, and watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. That's Ephesians 6, 18. Ephesians 6, 18. So as soon as you give your life to Christ, the commandment is there for you, that you as believers, you need to be, you need to take up the ministry of intercession. In James 4, verse 16, let's open to James 4, verse 16. The Bible says there, it says, confess your fault one to another, and then gossip. Is that what it says? It says, confess your fault one to another, and then backbite. It says, pray one for another. Pray one for another. Believers today, we find it difficult to even tell our sister or our brother what we have gone on. We find it difficult to tell our brother or sister what is going on with us. Why? Because some of our, I mean, some believers have taken job with CNN, MSNBC. They are the ones that will carry news, just take it all over the place. Instead of taking the news to heaven, instead of taking the problem to heaven, the Bible says, James 4, 16, confess your fault one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Availeth much. Availeth much. The righteous prayer, the, I mean, uh, the fervent prayer of a righteous man concerning the brother, uh, is our brother, concerning that sinner, availeth much. Availeth much. If only that believer can take the, I mean, the prayer to the, I mean, the person to the Lord in prayer, and the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. So there is a command for us to go, I mean, to, 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 to intercede on behalf of others. In 1 Samuel 12, verse 23, 1 Samuel 12, verse 23, this is somebody that understood that the call is upon him as a child of God, as a man of God, and the call is upon him to intercede on behalf of others. In 1 Samuel 12, verse 23, the Bible says there, it says, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord. If it's not a commandment, Samuel will not be saying it. That's what I mean. If you are not interceding, it's a sin. If you are not interceding on, on behalf of others, it's a sin because it's a commandment of God. It says, more. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Not for myself alone, but in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. I will teach you the good and the right way. The Lord will help us too in Jesus' name. So that we will see that as the Lord has given the commandment, that we should pray, we should intercede on behalf of others, we should intercede on behalf of our leaders, we should intercede on behalf of our nation. We will do it in Jesus' name. We will do it in Jesus' name. Let's look at the case of Gen Abraham in Genesis verse 18. Genesis verse 18, let's read for verse 23. The Bible says there, it says, And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty ri righteous that are daring? Let's, 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 let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to verse, verse 20. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. Is that not what is going on in America today? The cry of America is, has gone on to God. The cry of the babies that are killed every day. The rate of abortion, they were showing you the other day, that the rate of abortion now is like almost 20 times what it was in the 80s. And even though the law is still in place, there is a law against it in some state. There is a law against it at a certain stage of pregnancy, which they are trying to take away. They are trying to take it away that almost every pregnancy can be terminated. 
even at the age of seven months, if the baby is seven months, that's what they are trying to do. So the cry of those babies is, has gone to heaven. The cry of homosexuality has gone to heaven. And the, God said, and the cry, it says, and the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom and Gomorrah. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And the Lord is waiting for somebody to, 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 to stand before him and pray for this nation. And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure, there will be 50 righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? Be that be far from thee to do that after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That's, that, be far, that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all I do right? And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sake. If you look at it very well, the family of Lot are not even up to 50. If it's some of us today, where will we start from? Oh, my brethren that are there are just five. God, if you find five people in Sodom, will you spare Sodom? That's the selfishness of believers today. But Abraham is not a man like that. He said, if you find 50, peradventure if you find 50 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, will you spare that land? In verse 27, and Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak to the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five of the 50 righteous. Will thou also will thou destroy all the city for the lack of five? And he said, if I, there, if I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again, and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. Look at him. He tarried before the Lord. What concerns him I mean, with Sodom and Gomorrah? He's not living in Sodom and Gomorrah. But he tarried before the Lord for Sodom and Gomorrah. He tarried before the Lord. He tarried before the Lord that God, I don't want this. These people, you created them for your pleasure. You created them to serve you. Even though they are living in sin, it is not your, it is, I mean, you, you are not happy that they will go to hell. You are not happy that they will die in their sin. That's why he took it upon himself to plead on, the, I mean, on, on their behalf. He says, and he spake unto him yet again, and said, Peradventure, if there be forty found there, and he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be hungry, I will speak. Peradventure, there shall, there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Some of us would have given up. We would have given up. That, look, I think I've tried my best. Four, one, two, three times. I think, I, God, just do your own will. But this is not Abraham. This is not Abraham. Abraham will not do that. Abraham will not do that. Abraham is a true intercessor. He knows that even, I mean, he, he puts himself in their position. And that's what we don't do most time. We don't put ourselves in the position of people that need intercession. That what if I was the one? If not because of the grace of God that has saved me. If I was the one that is still in sin, would I pray for the judgment of God to come upon me? Would I pray for the judgment of God? Would I pray for the indignation of God to come upon this land? But the Lord says, and, and in verse 32, and he said, oh, oh, let not the Lord be hungry, and I will speak yet, but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communicating with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. So Abraham is a true example of somebody that understood the fact that as believers, we have been commanded to intercede. And he did it with all his mind. What about Moses? Let's look at Exodus 32, verse 30. Exodus 32, verse 30. It says, and it came to pass on the morning that Moses said unto the people, Ye have seen a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Who sinned? Was it Moses? Was it, Mo was it there when they sinned? It was not there when, when they sinned. He was in the presence of the Lord when they sinned. But he said, Though you people have sinned, but I will do what? I will go and intercede on your behalf. 
I will go unto the Lord. He knew that God was angry, but he still said, I will go up unto the Lord. Paraventure, I shall make an atonement for your sin. An atonement for your sin through interceding, intercession. Through interceding on your behalf. He went to the Lord. He even told the Lord that even if God would just blot out his name. That's the mind of an intercessor. That's the spirit of an intercessor. That God, if you, instead of you destroying just take out my name. I was, he wasn't the one that sinned. Take, blot my name out of your, I mean, your book of life. If you refuse to grant these people pardon. That's the spirit of an intercessor. He understood the power of intercession. He understand the commandment that God has called him unto that commandment. And the Lord will help us too in Jesus' name. The Lord will help us too in Jesus' name. We have read about Samuel, Samuel in 1 Samuel 12, 23 that we read. And also we see our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our perfect example. In Hebrews 7, verse 25. Hebrews 7, verse 25. The Bible says there, it says, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. See, he ever liveth to do what? Make intercession for them. Make intercession for them. That's, that's the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he was on the surface of the heart, he was continuously making intercession for them. Look at the, one, the practical case of the woman that was caught in adultery. If it's some of us will be there, we'll say, yes, she has committed it. Uh, the, the soul that sinners shall die. That's why we know all those scriptures. The soul that sinners shall die. Let her just die. Let, let, her, let her get the punishment that she, 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 I mean she deserves. But our Lord Jesus Christ will not do that. And the Bible is making us to understand here. It says, He ever liveth to make intercession for us. To make intercession on our behalf. And the Lord is calling us too. That as Jesus Christ is making intercession on behalf, He wants us to, as believers, commanding us to make intercession on behalf of others. And the Lord will give us the grace in Jesus' name. Let's look at a woman in the scriptures. In Luke verse 2. Sorry, chapter 2, verse 36 to 38. Luke chapter 2. Verse 36. Luke 2, verse 36. It says, there was, a, there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asa. She was of a great age. You see? It's not even about age. She was of a great age. She was of old. I mean, she was, she was, she was old. The Bible says there, it says, she was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years. Look at that. Four scores and four years. Which departed not from the temple. What was she doing in the temple? But serve God with fasting and prayers night and day. You think if she's just in the temple, fasting and praying for her own problem, you think the Bible will say she was serving God with fasting and prayer? No. Because she was in the temple fasting and praying for the need of the people. Fasting and praying for others. You will see in, the, in verse 38. Verse 38 says, and she coming in that instant gave thanks that's what, unto the Lord and spake of him to all men that look for redemption in Jerusalem. And spake of him of, for all men that look for redemption in Jerusalem. If you want to be a true evangelist for the Lord, if you want your evangelism to be effective, number one, you have to start from your knee. You have to be a true intercessor. If you don't commit your heart into the hand of the Lord, your words will just be the words of men. But if you are a great intercessor, intercessor, the passion, the compassion will be there. When you go out there and preach the gospel, your ministration will be effective. Look at her. She was a great intercessor before she became a great evangelist. Before she speaks to them, she served the Lord with fasting and prayer. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. That we too, as we have been called, as we have been saved, will not abandon this ministry of intercession, but rather will take time to call upon the Lord on behalf of people in Jesus' name. In Colossians 4, verse 12 to 13. We see a case of a man too. In Colossians 4, verse 12 to 13. The scripture says, it says, An Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you always, laboring fervently for you in prayers. Look at that, not for himself. 
not for his own family, not for his own children. He knows that they need prayer, but he labors fervently for others in prayer. What was, he, what was he laboring for them in prayer for? That ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. In all the will of God. Instead of you condemning people, saying, oh, it's not living right. Why don't you be like this man? Why don't you be like this man? That you are interceding on their behalf every time. That the Lord will make them holy. That the Lord will make them perfect. That the Lord will sanctify them truly. It says, for I bear him record that he had a great zeal for you. And them that are in Lodicia and there in Arapolis, you see? Not only people in the city, but he has a great seed for them, interceding on, your, on their behalf. The Lord will also give us that grace in Jesus' name. Now that we, are no, we know that God has called us to the ministry of intercession, he has commanded us that we as believers we should intercede. What are the things that is stopping us from doing it? What are the challenges that we are having as believers to intercessory prayer? The first challenge is this, point number two. The first challenge is believers are too preoccupied with worldly concern. We are too preoccupied with worldly concern. Lord, bless me indeed. I want to buy a house. Lord, we, we spend hours. We spend months. We spend days fasting and prayer. That the, Even the, the house we want to buy, we are buying it with loan. But for the loan to go through, we spend weeks praying that God will make the loan to go through. But we, we, we know of a dying sinner. We know of a dying country. We, we have never spent an hour praying for that country. Which one is more important? A soul that is dying or the mortgage we are trying to get? Or the mortgage we are trying to get? So believers today are too preoccupied with worldly concern. Believers are indirectly like um, Demas today. Even though they are still in church, but they are forsaking the Lord. They have departed to the world in their hearts. Believers today would rather abandon prayer meeting just because they are, their sister or their family member is having birthday party. They will choose birthday party over prayer meeting. They will choose uh, events that doesn't even, I mean, that doesn't even glorify God. They will choose it over prayer meeting. Why? Because they know that that prayer meeting, the purpose of that prayer meeting is to come and intercede on behalf of the church. It's to come and intercede on behalf of other people. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. I say the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. So they hold the things of the world as priority over the things of God. Let's look at Acts 6 verse 4. The Bible says there, it says, but we will give ourselves, what? Continually to prayer and to the ministry of the world. Continuously to prayer and to the ministry of the world. Not serving food. Look at verse 2. Let's go to verse 2. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and do what? Serve tables. It is not. That's not what God has called you to. It's not about function, function, function every time. It's not about event, event, event every time. The Lord has called us to a ministry of prayer and supplication. It says, verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the world. That will be our resolution too in Jesus' name. In Matthew 6, verse 19, believers, they are too preoccupied with worldly concern. In, in Matthew 6, verse 19, the scripture says, Lay not for yourself treasures upon the heart, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. So those things that you are running after, that is making you not to do the work of intercession, that is making you not to do the ministry that God has called you upon. God is telling you that those things, they one day, they will, they, will, they will be gone. They will be gone. They will be gone. A man of God was saying one thing. He said, it is a crime for a believer to still have a sinner as members of his family. He said, it is a crime. And the reason why he's saying this is this. He gave his own testimony. He said, for every sinner in his family, he devoted a day of prayer for every one of them. He said, until the last one of them got saved. He kept praying for them. Not only speaking the word of God to them, praying for them. Committing their heart into the hand of the Lord. Committing their heart into the hand of the Lord. Committing their heart into the hand of the Lord. Look, sometimes it's not even the word that, that will bring the salvation. That will, that will bring the salvation. How many of us have heard the story of Franklin Graham? He's the son of Billy Graham. This boy just chose to go the way of the world. The father is a popular preacher. Americans know the father. 
to the extent that the father was scared that this boy was going to destroy his ministry. But the mother would not, for one day, he said his mother would not, for one day, run after him, start pushing him to church. No. She does everything on her knee. She does everything on her knee. He said one day he entered the house. He found the mother praying. And she was weeping. He said he was scared. That, ah, ah, why is mommy weeping? And all he was hearing is, God, save my son Franklin. Save my son Franklin. And he broke down there and he gave his life to Christ. And till now is a man of God. Till now is a man of God. Whatsoever you can't do with your hands, you can't do with your mouth, you can do it on your knees. You can intercede on your knees. I don't care how, I mean, how, uh, how worst of a sinner your boss is, how worst of a sinner your, your, your colleague at work is. If they cannot take your word, they can take, the power of God can arrest them. If only you will take time to pray. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. The second reason why believers are having challenges to intercessory prayer is because believers are selfish just in plain language. Believers are selfish in plain language. Don't let us mix words. Believers are selfish. We seek only for our own. We go to places of prayer just because we want God to take care of our own problem. In Psalm 18 verse 1, what does the scripture say there? That's why we have abandoned the, uh, we abandoned the, the work of intercessory. In Psalm 18, oh sorry, I think it, that's a wrong reference. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to 6. First Corinthians 13. Verse uh, Let's first, let's first read verse, um, sorry, chapter 12, verse 26 first. Let's first read chapter 12, verse, sorry, verse 12. Chapter 12, verse 12. It says, for as the body is one, and hath many members, and all members of that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. That simply means, this place is telling us that we are all one. Whether the sister is from Ghana, she's from Nigeria, she's from Congo, she's from Afghanistan, wherever the person comes from, we are all one. Until we get that into our mentality. It says, verse 26, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Then verse 13, verse 4 to 6, it says, charity suffereth long. It's talking about love now, and it's crying. Charity envieth not. Charity vented not itself. It's not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not our own. That's what believers does now. We say, we all, oh, I love my sister. I love my brother. Well, all we are doing is seeking our own, seeking our own. And we say we have love. We are not demonstrating the love of God. If God, if God says we should love the way he has loved us, look at it this way. And he chooses to hold back his own only begotten son, what he cherished most. He chooses to hold it back. What will be your faith today? What will be my faith today? But we are holding... All this God is just telling us is your time. Give your time to your sister in prayers. Give your devotion to your sister in prayer. That's what God is asking for. It's not even asking for any sacrifice. It's not asking for you to bring your son. It's not asking for you to bring your daughter and sacrifice it for that sister. No. He was able to do it for you. He expressed his love towards us. While we are yet sinner, not when we have given our life to Christ, that Christ died. Why we are yet sinner, when we don't even deserve his mercy, when we don't deserve his love, he gave his love unto us. Why is it that you can't give it to others too? In the, in the, in the place of prayer. It says, but not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not our own, it's not easily provoked, and seeketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in, in iniquity. He doesn't rejoice in iniquity. You tell a sister today, you tell a brother today in the church, oh, that sister, that pastor has fallen. The first thing is they will start laughing. Is that, I mean, are, are you rejoicing that the person is has fallen out of grace? At, no. All you need to do is go to the Lord in prayer. Go to the Lord in prayer. It says, rejoice not, not in equity, but rejoice it in the truth. The Lord will give us the grace in Jesus' name. Philippians 2, verse 1 to 4. 
In Philippians 2, verse 1 to 4, the Bible says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same what? Love. Being of one and accord, of one mind. If we have the same love, one, we are in one accord, we are of one mind. We'll pray for one another. We'll see our sister, my sister's problem to be my problem. To be my problem. And that's why sometimes God doesn't answer our prayer. A man of God was saying one time, he said when he was praying for his son, children that were sick, he was interceding on their behalf. What he was telling those, he said he kept telling God, God, heal my child, heal my child, heal my child. <clears throat> the Lord told him that, okay, if, you're, if it's your child, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. He said until he now put him place, himself into the, in the place of the children and said, God, heal us as a family. So that was where God, the miracle happened that the children were healed. Put yourself in the place of that sister. That God, until you do it for her, until you do it for this person, until you save this soul, I will not let you rest. Until you save this person. You think God will not do it? God will do it. God will do it. Let me ask us this question. And I want us to be sincere. How many of us prayed for Osama Bin Laden? How many of us? Why? Because we seem to be worst of sinners. We seem that the mercy of God cannot even catch him. Who are you to do that? To do that? Who are you? Who are you? Put yourself in his place. Not as saying, I'm not saying that you are the one that's going to. What of if you hear that it's your family member that has done something like, like that? You will seek the face of the Lord. That God in a miraculous way will at least save his soul. You know that he's going to die. America is going to kill him one day. But God, please save his soul so that he doesn't go and rot in hell. But most of us, we are judgmental. We pass our judgment unto him. That, oh, well, he has done something wrong. He deserves he deserve it. That's not the ministry that God has called us unto. He has called us into the ministry of reconciliation. And the Lord will give us the grace in Jesus' name. The other thing that makes believers not to do the work of intercession well is laziness and slothfulness. Laziness and slothfulness. Believers are lazy today. Even to pray for themselves, they are lazy to do it. How are they going to be able to pray for others? Believers are very slothful in the spirit these days. They are very lazy. But when you are saying they are lazy, they are not lazy concerning their own personal job, the job that brings them money. But the work of the kingdom, believers are so lazy. Believers are so slothful. Believers will come to church when you know that church is starting 9 o'clock. You get to church 10 o'clock, you will still be working as if you, you are coming at 8 o'clock. At your place of work, you will be running because you want to go serve a man. But when it comes to the service of God, we are so slothful. And that's what is affecting every facet of Christian life. Not only one. Because when you are slothful in coming to the presence of the Almighty God, you will be slothful in praying unto him. That is just, that's just the basic truth. When you, are so, you, when you are slothful in coming to his presence, you'll be slothful when it comes to the work of evangelism. You will not take it serious. The Lord will give us the grace in Jesus' name. In Romans 12, verse 11, we say, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, serving the Lord through prayer, serving the Lord through intercession. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Colossians 4, 12 to 13. Colossians 4, 12 to 13. We're going to read about the man again. It says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you always, laboring fervently for you in prayer, that you may stand perfect and complete in all and the will of God. He was laboring fervently. He was putting all his energy. He was putting all his strength. He was putting all his time. He was putting all his talent. I'm sure if you can put your time and talent, definitely his money will not be too hard for him to even put into the into, into it. If it will cost him anything, he will put it into it to make sure that the work is done. The other thing that is making believers not to do the work of intercession, which is one of the challenges, is holier than thou attitude. Holier than thou attitude. We have judgmental spirit like the Pharisees. We easily pass judgment. Oh, well, America is going through what they are going through because of their sin. Yes, we understand. But is that what God has called you unto? He has not called you into the ministry of condemnation. He has called you into the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation through intercession. In Matthew 7, verse 1 to 5. 
Matthew 7, 1 to 5. The Bible says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye met, it shall be met, measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mute, the mute that is in thy brother's eye? But consider not the beam that is in thy own eye. Or how will thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thy eye, and behold a beam in thy own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thy own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mouth out of thy brother's eye. So the spirit, the judgmental spirit is making believers who have challenge in the area of intercessory prayer. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 to 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 21. The Bible says there, it says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us what? What has he given unto us? The ministry of reconciliation. Not the ministry of condemnation. Not the ministry of judgment. Not the ministry of backbiting. Not the ministry of gossip, which some believers have taken upon themselves. They spend hours on the phone. Talk and talk and talk about that sinner. Talk and talk and talk about the, I mean, the judgment of God upon that person. They spend zero hours praying for that person. Praying for that person. It says he has called us unto the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not in putting their trespasses, what? Upon them. Not in putting their trespasses upon them. And has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation. Verse 20, now that ye are ambassadors of Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled unto God, for he hath made him to be sin for us. Would knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He reconciled us, he was, I mean, he reconciled us unto God by what? By making himself to be sin. He, just, he didn't know the sin, but he stood on our behalf, and the Lord is telling you too, stand on behalf of a sinner today. Call upon the name of God on behalf of a sinner. Call upon heaven on behalf of a, I mean, a sinner nation and the lord will do it in jesus name the last reason why believers have challenges in intercession is because believers see intercession as a gift they say oh that sister knows how to pray she has been called into that ministry of intercession oh that brother knows how to call upon the name of the lord he has been called into that ministry of intercession no it's not a gift and it's not an option it's a mandate it's a command unto every believer it's a command unto every believer it's a ministry that every believer must hold, and every believer must do well in Jesus' name. So what are the characteristics of genuine intercessors? The last of heading. What are the characteristics of genuine intercessors? The first thing is they have to be genuinely saved. They have to be genuinely saved. There is a saying in law that he that will seek equity must come with what? With clean hand. He that will seek equity must come with clean hand. How many of us have seen a lawyer with a criminal record representing somebody? No? You won't see that. You won't see that. So if you want to intercede on behalf of people, if you want to be an effective intercessor, yourself, your life must be clean. Your life must be clean. Your life must be clean. Your life must not only be clean, your life, you have to be daily living a holy life. In Psalm 24, verse 3 to 6. Psalm 24, verse 3 to 6. It says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord through prayer? We shall ascend into the hill of the Lord through prayer. We shall ascend into the hill of the Lord through intercession. We shall ascend into the hill of the Lord. Or oh, we shall stand in his holy place. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfulness. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. So if you want to be an effective intercessor, if you want to be a genuine intercessor, you must watch your life and be sure that your life is right with God. The second thing is this, that makes you to be an effective intercessor is you must be ready to tarry long in the place of prayer. You must be ready to tarry long in the place of prayer. The ministry of intercession is just not one short kind of prayer that will pray, oh Lord, take care of my brother that is not saved. No. It's a prayer you pray every time every day. It's a ministry you take upon yourself. You spend time to do it every time. You must be ready to tarry long in the place of prayer. In Colossians 1 verse 9 to 11. 
He said, for this cause, we also, since the day we had it, do not cease to pray for you. You see? Since the day we had it. Since the day we had it. That day might be ten, two years ago. That day might be one year ago. That day might be three months ago. He said, we do... He said, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That ye may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and love suffering with joyfulness. You see? Since the day we heard about it, since the day we heard about it, we have not ceased praying. So if you want to be an effective intercessor, you have to be ready to tarry long in a place of prayer. The third thing is you have to be able to identify, agonize, and take authority for those you are interceding for. You have to be ready to identify weights. Don't go to the Lord in prayer and say, God, that's sinning brother. I know that your destruction is supposed to come upon him. I know that he is so bad that he has done so much. I know that this is what he has done. Don't do that. That's not the work of an intercessor. That's not what the work of an intercessor. A true intercessor will identify. He will identify with. He will agonize with. And also he will take authority for those they are interceding for. Let's look at the case of Daniel in Daniel 9 verse 5. Daniel here was praying for the sin of the people. But look at the way he prayed this prayer in verse 5. It was not part of the sin. Get it right. It was not part of it one bit. It says, we have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgment. He identified with the sin of the people. Identifying with the sin of the person you are praying for does not make you to be the sinner. Get that right. It does not change your status from a believer to a sinner. But it helps you to be able to pray with more passion. You put yourself in, the, in that place that, okay, that brother has committed a sin. That sister has committed a sin. If I was one that committed that sin, how would I pray for the forgiveness of God? That's why you have to identify with their problem. So that you'll be able to agonize with them. So that you'll be able to agonize in the presence of the Lord. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. The fourth thing that you need to do for you to be an effective intercessor, you have to intercede with faith and perseverance. With faith and perseverance. That's why the Bible says that he that will come to God will, come, will know that he is God and is I mean, the rewarder of those that are diligently seeking. They will come with faith, knowing that he is the rewarder of those that are diligently seeking. Look at the case of Abraham. Abraham went unto the Lord. It was pleading on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. What did he do? He persevered in the presence of the Lord. He persevered in the presence of the Lord. He did not just do it one time, two times. He persevered in the presence of the Lord. And the Lord is telling you to persevere, persevere in the place of prayer for your brother. Persevere in the place of prayer for your sister. And the Lord will do it in Jesus' name. The Lord will do it in Jesus' name. And also, for you to become an effective intercessor, you have to pray with more intensity and passion like Elijah. You have to pray with intensity and passion like Elijah. Elijah prayed with his head between his knees when he was praying. He wasn't praying for himself. He was praying that God would intervene. He was praying for the intervention of God. But he put himself in a awkward position. Why? Because he wanted to pray with all intensity. He wanted to pray with all passion. That's what God is saying. That if you want to be a true intercessor, you forget your comfort. That's what he's saying. Forget your comfort. Because some of us, we only want to pray when it's comfortable. We only want to pray for others when it's suitable. We only want to pray for others when we think it's right for us. No. Forget your comfort. It's not about you. It's not about you. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And also, they, they feel compelled to earnestly pray for others. They feel compelled to always, they don't see it as an option. Like the case of Samuel. That Samuel said, I, I mean, God forbid that I sin against God for not praying for you. They feel compelled. An effective intercessor feel compelled to pray for others. They feel compelled. They see it not to be an option, but they see it to be a commandment of the Lord. The seventh thing is that they hear from God more regularly and more accurately. Why? Because they have turned their ears 
from the frequency of the world. Not, they, they are not the type that all they want to hear is gossips, backbites. No. All they want to do is go to the Lord in prayer. So because they spend more time in the presence of the Lord, they hear more accurately from the Lord. They hear, look at Abraham. Look at the way God was talking to him. I wish God can be talking to me like that every time. I will have solution to almost every problem. Look at him. Why? Because he's a great intercessor. He was hearing directly, conversing with the Lord, conversing with the Lord, conversing with the Lord. The Lord will take us there too in Jesus' name. I said the Lord will take us there in Jesus' name. So they also to be an effective intercessor, you have to have a daily awareness of the spiritual battle being waged in such a way that you feel drawn to lift up prayers. You have to have that awareness in you that this thing that is going on, that person that is lingering in sin, it's not only it's not that they want to stay in sin. Some of them is a spiritual battle. And that's why God is telling you to intercede on your behalf. Some of them, they don't know the reason why they are doing it. They don't know the reason why they, keep, they refuse to give their life to Christ. They don't know the reason why they keep just continuing in one sin or the other, one sin or the other, and they are progressing. So to be an effective intercessor, you have to see it as a spiritual battle, and you have to be ready to fight, for it, to fight on their behalf. Number nine, you have to be convinced that God moves in direct response to fervent prayer. Until you get to the point that you believe that God answers prayer. Most times we only believe that God answers our home prayer. Our pro pro prayer about our home problems. When it comes to others, we don't, we don't have that same faith. We have the faith to pray unto God that God, who are down mountain before me, who are down this, get away, who are this, who are that. We have that faith to cast all those mountains away. But when it comes to others, we don't apply the same faith. But to be a true intercessor, to be an effective intercessor, you have to be convinced that God moves in direct response to fervent prayer and that God is able to take away every problem. If you have that assurance, that will keep you on your knees. That God, I know you can do it. I know this problem. I know this problem of America. I know this problem of this man. I know this problem of this woman. It's not too hard for you to do. And it will keep us on our knees to pray for, unto God for that individual. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And finally, they pray in response to the leading of the Spirit. Whether they understand it or not. Whether they understand it or not. We always wait until we understand it before we pray for it. Whether you understand why that brother, sister has that problem or not. Whether you understand why that brother has that problem or not. You as an intercessor, you are not an investigator. You are an intercessor. Stop investigating. Why would she have that problem? Why is it that she can't have baby? Why is it that they can't do this? Why is it that this is not happening? Is it that because of her past life? Is it that because of his past life? Is that your calling? You, don't, you are not an FBI. That's not your calling.